The deformation pattern not only changes with different reduction conditions, but also with die angle. We can find the slip line field for a 90 degree die angle and 50% reduction in this experiment using slip line wax. As before, the field is developed to reductions either less than 50% or greater than 50%. And again, our best guess for the upper bound fields are straightened out versions of the slip line fields. We find these three upper bound fields. The deformation can be followed in the model material experiment. This shows the case of 50% reduction with a die angle of 90 degrees. With very high die angles, we find that triangular zones of dead material are formed in the blind corners of the extrusion die. This is also compatible with the assumed upper bound fields. It takes some time for the dead zones to develop in full, but now you can already see that the vertical lines tend to pile up near the corners. Here again, the experimental and theoretical networks show good agreement. We now turn to a reduction less than 50%. In this case, the velocity of the deformed material is relatively low. This makes it easier to study the development of dead zones. In the bottom of the picture, you see a fully developed dead zone. Eventually, the material flow causes this zone to be covered with a layer of lubricant. As a result, the deformation near the edges of the extruded material is high in the beginning, but it becomes very low after some time when the dead zones have developed. And here we can see the predetermined deformation pattern using upper bound theory compared with the experiment. Finally, let us consider the forward extrusion process with a reduction of 60% and with a 90 degree die angle. This time, the velocity of the deformed material is relatively high. The dead zones develop more slowly in relation to the extruded length but the strain gradients along the edges of the bar are also present in this case. And once again, we can compare the resulting deformation patterns. So much for the stationary extrusion process. Next, we will consider a simple non-steady process, a double indentation with plain indenters. As before, the slip line wax helps us to understand the deformation fields inside the material. The slip line field looks like this, and it is straightened out into an upper bound field. A confirmation of the validity of the slip line field can be obtained 
by comparing these forgings of cylindrical specimens of steel and slipline wax. As before, the hodograph associated with this field is constructed by first numbering its regions. We only consider one quarter field since it has double symmetry. The velocity in region three is vertical and assumed known. It is drawn first and we extend it since we know that the velocity of region one is also vertical. In region four, the material moves horizontally. Finally, points two and one are found on the hodograph by drawing lines parallel to the remaining lines of discontinuity in the field. With a non-steady process, you can only construct a deformation grid with difficulty. Therefore, the physical models become our most important tool of analysis. When we go to a complicated forging process, it is convenient to divide the process into simpler sub-processes. If we consider this forging, we notice several sub-processes during the deformation. The first step is a compression of the specimen. This is replaced by a bar extrusion into the upper tool. Next, a tube extrusion begins in the lower tool. And finally, there follows an extrusion of a flash. Here is a plain model of the forging process using plasticine as a model material. Even in the case of very complicated metalworking processes, reliable analyses can be made by using a suitable combination of theoretical and physical models.